let me go ahead and thank you in advance for your attentiveness. We're going to be about 35, maybe 40 minutes in this lesson this morning. And I know that camp fatigue is real. I know that you were really excited. You burn up a lot of energy uh, the last three full days. And I know that sometimes the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And one of the things that God has given you to help the flesh be a little bit more strengthened is your neighbor sitting next to you. So I'm giving you permission and an assignment. If your neighbor next to you begins to doze off, you give them the sharpest elbow that you possibly can and look at your neighbor already drifting off and say, I think he's talking about you. All right, we're going to be some wonderful time together in the Lord's Word today. And I say that in part because, and I'm being as serious as I can, I don't know any message, I don't know any theme, any subject, that the devil fights more with disinterest, apathy, or even physical, almost unhelpable, inevitable fatigue then when we're talking about sharing our faith, sharing the gospel with somebody else who's lost, and praying that God would use us to see them come to faith in Christ. For some 19 verses, Jude has been talking about the darkness that filled his culture. But starting in verse 20, where we were last night, he moves from exposing the darkness to shining the light. He tells us how we are supposed to be used by God to contend, to defend, and to push back the darkness to make a difference. Now, to establish the cultural context for this, I want to just share some things about lostness in our own culture in our own day. Students, all around us every day, people are dying lost and going to hell. And you can go to hell from Blackshear as easily as you can from anywhere else in the world. You can go to hell from Hortense or Hoboken or Nahana or Bristol or Marshawn or Waycross, Waresboro. You fill in the blank. You can go to hell from Alma as easily as you can from Atlanta or Africa. Anybody who dies without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ does not go to heaven They go to a place the Bible describes as hell. And all around us every day, people are perishing. I want you to jot down just a few phrases. First of all, you'll notice on the screen, people are perishing globally. All around the world, people are dying lost without Christ. And we ask sometimes, well, what happens to people who are in these dark places of the world, like these unreached people groups that uh, some of you are going in a little over two weeks down to the jungles of Peru to engage some unreached, unengaged people groups? We, we often hear this question, what about those people who have never heard? I've got a better question. What about those of us who have heard and are not concerned about those, not, not in Africa, but on our school campus, on our bus, on our team that we encounter every single day who've never heard the gospel? But around the world, statistically, four billion people will live their entire life and never hear the gospel one single time. More than 12 million people a year, almost a quarter million a week, 32,000 a day, 1,400 an hour, 23 a minute, roughly one person every three seconds breathes their last breath and slips out into eternity, not having rejected Christ, having never even heard the gospel of Christ. And if you ask, well, what, what in the world happens to them? Listen to me carefully. Every single person who lives has enough witness in creation itself, according to Romans chapter 1, not not to be converted, but to be condemned. We've got enough revelation that there is a God, we're not Him. People who die without being saved go to hell, even if they've never heard the gospel. This is the urgency of the hour. People are perishing globally. People are perishing also nationally. In the last 25 years, our country has moved into what is rightly known as a post-Christian era. The fastest growing religious groups in America are not even biblical Christians. They are the, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the nation of Islam. Roman Catholicism, which is not a faithful declaration of the biblical gospel, is also growing because of the increased influence of people from Spanish-speaking nations where Roman Catholicism is often so prevalent. People are perishing globally and nationally. People are perishing regionally. When I was growing up, we called places like South Georgia the buckle of the Bible belt. Well, I want you to know that the buckle has come off and the belt is loosened. More than 80% 
8 out of 10, more than 80% of Pierce, Ware, Brantley, Bacon, and Wayne counties will be in nobody's church this Sunday. And it's not because it's the middle of the summer. It's not because we're headed towards July 4 uh, celebration. It's not because everybody's down at Fernandina or down at St. Augustine or Daytona or over at Destin or Panama City Beach. It's going to be that way every single Sunday. In fact, the average is about 80% every Sunday. It may be a little higher this Sunday because of faithful Christians who are on vacation, including some of your families. But across the state of Georgia, around 70%, listen carefully, you've heard stuff drop before, listen, around 70% of people in the state of Georgia don't even have a church affiliation that they could answer if somebody took a door-to-door survey like Brother Mac described last night, hey, does your family attend a church in this area? More than 7 out of 10 don't even have an answer. That includes the people that lie and make stuff up and say they go to Emmanuel, say they go to Bridge, say they go to First Baptist. They're included in the 30% who have an answer. But 7 out of 10 don't even have an answer of where they go to church, much less a personal relationship with the Lord. People are perishing globally and nationally and regionally. People are perishing congregationally. Every year in our own Southern Baptist Convention, around 10,000 churches report zero baptisms. There are around 48,000 Southern Baptist churches in the United States, and about 20% of them report that they did not win anyone to Christ. Students, listen carefully. That means 10,000 pastors went all year and didn't lead anybody to Jesus. That means 10,000 deacon chairmen went all year and didn't win anybody to Jesus. Most of them had at least one leader in what we would call Sunday school. They may call it a Bible fellowship or a life group or a home group, a cell group. That's 10,000 Bible teachers who went all year and never won anybody to Jesus. At two sermons a week, If you just think maybe Sunday morning and Wednesday night or Sunday morning and Sunday night, two sermons a week, that's 1,040,000 sermons that didn't have enough of the touch of God on them to even get a little seven-year-old boy walking down the aisle. That three songs a week, that's over three million songs that did not share enough of the power of the gospel to see anybody come to faith in Christ. And I want to tell you as bluntly as I know how, that's not merely a pastor's fault. That's not merely a deacon's fault. That's not just a Sunday school teacher's fault. Because if God's people were doing what God has called God's people to do, then I could be the worst preacher in all of America. I could preach on any subject that didn't even have the gospel in it. And somebody ought to be walking down the aisle presenting themselves as a, as a new follower of Jesus Christ because somebody like you led somebody like them to Jesus in the school, in the neighborhood, in the workplace earlier in the week. People are perishing congregationally, but... But most tragically, people are perishing individually. People are perishing individually. People don't go to hell in groups. People either go to heaven or hell individually. You've heard perhaps the story of the little boy who was walking along the beach and it was the morning after a tremendous storm on the sea and that that storm had just washed up Thousands and thousands and thousands of starfish. And starfish can't survive long out of the water. And the little boy was picking up starfish one at a time and tossing them back into the surf, back into the ocean. And somebody looked at him and said, son, you're never going to be able to get all these starfish back into the water. You cannot save them all. They're going to die in the summer heat before you get all of them back in the water. You cannot save them all. And he reached over and picked up another one. He was un deterred, undistracted by the criticism. He reached over and picked up one more and he said, I saved that one. He was just concerned about the ones that he could save and the ones that he could reach. And that's what Jude is writing to us about. And I want you to get this on your heart. If you don't take anything else back home tomorrow when we leave than this, God has not called us to be defenders of the faith for the purpose of winning an argument. Though there will be some arguments to win. Your apologetics class that Brother Lynn, I know, is so ably teaching every afternoon is not for the purpose of winning an argument. It's for the purpose of winning a soul. For the purpose of knowing and being able to declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Now, with that in mind, I'm just going to give you three simple statements this morning from these two verses. 
There are no sub points, but I just want to encourage you to write these statements down because Jude has in mind in these two verses three different types or categories of sinners, three different uh, spiritual postures, if you will, of people who don't have a relationship with Jesus. And he gives us slightly different advice as to what our attitude and approach should be with each of these three groups. So number one, write this down, we need to care for the doubting sinner. Verse 22, and on some have compassion, making a difference or a distinction. Sort of leaps off the page that he doesn't say, and on all have compassion. But he says, and on some. He is describing for us different categories, spiritual dispositions of people without Christ. Now the word here for uh, that he's talking about, and on some have compassion making distinction. I think he's talking to those who yet to make a decision or a final judgment about their relationship with Christ. It's those who are doubting. They're not calloused. They're just confused. Now the reason that I say that is because of our parallel passage. What's the parallel book of the book of Jude? The book of Second Peter. And in the parallel passage, as, as the book of 2 Peter kind of tracks along a little bit longer, fleshes it out a little more, but as 2 Peter kind of tracks along with this particular text, he refers to them, Peter does, as unstable souls. They're just uncertain. Now that does not mean that they're not lost. It doesn't mean that they're not hell-bound. It just means that they're probably at a stage in life, they're looking for something, they don't know what it is, they're not searching for God, but they're searching for something, and they'll listen to anybody and everybody that will tell them anything about anything. Statisticians now call them the nuns, not like a Catholic nun, but the word nun, N-O-N-E, with an S on the end, because when you ask them what is your faith, they don't have one. What's your religious affiliation? They don't have one. So most of the surveys, they write none, N-O-N-E. And this is one of the largest groups in the United States of America. And I'm just convinced that some of those nuns would become some of the ones if some of the ones would take the gospel to some of the nuns. And the approach here is to simply have compassion, to care enough to share the gospel. I am convinced, or early in my ministry, I used to preach that some of us needed more boldness. You say, we're scared to share the gospel. And I would say that some of us need boldness, and that's not completely untrue. I would also, I used to preach that some of us need more knowledge, and we should prepare ourselves and be ready at all times to give an answer for the hope that is within us. So, yes, it's true that some of us need more boldness. It's also true that some of us need more knowledge. But I am convinced that the biggest thing that we're lacking is not in our backbone and it's not even in our mind, it's in our heart. To just simply care enough if we believe that people without Christ are dying in their sin and going to hell. The approach that he gives in verse 22 on some have compassion, making a difference. The approach here is to simply care for the doubting sinner. One of the ways that I study the Bible and prepare sermons, I use an online tool called blueletterbible.org. You ought to jot that down. You can just do a lot of cross-referencing tools there. And one of the things that's interesting is to find a word in the verse that you're reading and see where that particular word, especially that Greek word, the New Testament originally written in Greek, find out where that word is used throughout the rest of the Bible. That will give you some idea of how the Holy Spirit tends to use that word. And the word that is rendered here as compassion, verse 22, and on some have compassion, is also translated as mercy. On some have mercy. And that word is used in some powerful ways throughout the New Testament. Matthew loved to use this word. And in Matthew 9, he says that two blind men were sitting by the road and they heard that Jesus was passing by. And they began to cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowd said, he didn't want anything to do with you. Don't bother 
Jesus. He's got stuff to do. And that's one of the problems that we have. We've always got too much stuff to do. And most of it is stuff that isn't going to matter three seconds after eternity begins. They say, don't bother the master. But these men cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And that's the word the Bible uses here. It's interesting to me that in Matthew 15, a woman we call the Syrophoenician woman, she had a daughter that was demon-possessed. And she came to Jesus and she asked Jesus, would you have mercy on my daughter? Parents and grandparents here know what it's like when you have a child or a grandchild that they need something. Imagine how you would pray for that child that had gotten a cancer diagnosis or a leukemia diagnosis. And you're, you're wanting Jesus to have some mercy on your child. And that's the word the Bible says that we need to have in our heart for people who don't yet know the Lord Jesus. That, that the word is also used in Matthew 17, not a mama asking for mercy for her daughter, but a daddy asking mercy for his son. In the same way that a dad who had a son that was on his way to hell or on his way to the grave with some sickness would pray and ask the master healer, ladies, I want you to listen to me carefully, okay? In the same way that a daddy would pray for his son and a mama would pray for her daughter, that's the word that Jude uses. It's also found in Matthew chapter 18. Do you remember it's a parable about forgiveness? There was a man who owed a great debt, and his master brought him in, and and the man begged for what? He begged for mercy, and the master gave him mercy. And then that forgiven servant went out and found a fellow servant who only owed him a few dollars, and he threatened to throw him into prison. And the master found out about it and called the forgiven servant in. Listen, there's a very important lesson here. Called the forgiven servant in. And says essentially, how dare you act that way? After all the mercy that I gave you, how could you not have shown mercy on your fellow servant? And I think there's a real principle here that you and I who have been shown lavish mercy, If it really is your testimony that you sang a while ago, I was a mess, I was lost in my sin, and your love has lifted me from the pit. Thank you, God, your love, your mercy has lifted me. The question today, how can we who have been shown such lavish mercy not have any mercy in our own heart for fellow sinners who are deep in debt as we were? And here the Bible says, on some have mercy, on some have compassion. You... If you read the text this morning in your devotional, you came across this word mercy. In Luke 16, 24, the man who is in hell, I believe a true story, so still in hell today, cried out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to my father's house where I have five brothers. Here's a man in hell who's praying that somebody would have enough mercy to go tell his lost family members on the earth how they could be saved. Jude says that should be our perspective. On some, what you really just need is some mercy and compassion to care enough about their condition to care for the doubting sinner. But there's a second group. In verse 23, you need to share with the determined sinner. Jude moves from those who are doubting to those who've already decided. They've made a determination. They, they, ha- they don't want anything to do with the Lord Jesus. When you and I sing, I have decided to follow Jesus, they could rightly sing, I have decided not to follow Jesus. They've heard it before. They may even be able to quote the gospel. They used to go to church. Maybe they came to a student group. Maybe they came to a student camp and nobody would talk to them. Nobody would sit with them. Maybe somebody said something unkind about them. They got their feelings hurt and they turned their back not only on the church but on the Lord. And now as far as they're concerned, they don't even want to hear it anymore. But what does the Bible say we should do with people like that? Look in verse 23. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. 
There was an old hymn that we used to sing called Rescue the Perishing. I don't think we've sung it in years. But it says, uh, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep or the erring one, lift up the fallen, and tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. I think Fanny Crosby, the great hymn writer, got that idea from Jude 23. Others save with fear, pulling them, snatching them, grabbing them out of the fire. Now, this is not, of course, an earthly fire, but an eternal fire. This is why I had you read this morning from Luke chapter 16, a real story about real people who went to a real place called hell. There are a lot of preachers today, apostates, who say that hell is not real that hell is a figment of the imagination. Last year, uh, a man who used to be one of the most prominent Pentecostal preachers in America, Carlton Pearson, uh, died. And he had, later in his ministry, denied the faith and denied that there was a real place called hell. A prominent contemporary preacher named Rob Bell years ago wrote a book called Love Wins, And uh, I do believe that love wins, but not in the way that he thinks love wins. Because the premise of his book is that God is love, and because God is love, God would never send anyone to hell. And so love, heaven, is going to win out in the end for everyone. But the Bible still teaches that there is a literal place called hell. Jude believed in hell. Look back in verse 7. Jude 7 concludes by saying, that these cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth for us as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The apostle John believed in a place called hell. And in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, wake your neighbor up in verses 11 through 15, the Bible says that those whose names were not found in the book of life were cast into the lake, not of water, but the lake of fire. Peter believed in hell. In 2 Peter 3, 6, again, a parallel passage, he writes that God turned Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes as an example to the ungodly of what will happen when people die and go to hell. The apostle Paul believed in hell. Luke believed in hell. But the greatest preacher of all time believed in hell. Jesus Christ preached about a place called hell. In Matthew 13, he says, The Son of Man is going to send His angels, and they will gather out of the kingdom all the things that offend and those who have practiced lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. In Matthew 25, 41, Jesus will say to those on His left hand, Depart from Me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Every person who dies lost, even those who don't believe in hell, will suddenly believe in hell about a half second after they die. William Booth, who was the founder of a group called the Salvation Army, said one time that he thought the best training for soul winning was not a gospel tract. It wasn't a 45-minute class to teach you how to mark your Bible and go through the Romans road. William Booth once said that the greatest training tool for a soul winner would be to spend about five seconds in hell. Care for the doubting sinner. Share with the determined sinner. Before I move on, could I ask you a question? And students, I want every eye right here, I want you to listen to me as clearly as if you hadn't heard anything else all week long. If right now you had 60 seconds to tell somebody, sometimes it's called an elevator story. That is, you get on an elevator with somebody on the first floor and y'all riding up to the tenth floor together. And that's the only time you've got. you got 60 seconds at best to tell someone the simple message of the gospel. What would you say to them? What Bible verse would you use or quote? And I want to say this as plainly as I know how, not to confuse anybody, but maybe by God's Holy Spirit to convict somebody. If you do not have an answer, if you don't have an answer 
I don't know what I'd tell them. Then you are lost. If you can't tell me how to get to the cafeteria, it's because you hadn't been. It's real simple. Go out that door and turn to the left and keep walking until you smell the food. If you say you're a junior at Pierce County High School and you've been there 9th, 10th, 11th grade, you're a rising senior, and you can't tell me how to get from Emmanuel Baptist Church to Pierce County High School, I doubt you've ever been. And the message of the gospel is so simple. And you've heard it so many times that I seriously doubt you're even saved. If you say, I don't know what I'd tell somebody else. Just tell them what you did. Since there's only one way to be saved, just tell them what you did. Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Care for the doubting sinner, share with the determined sinner. Thirdly, beware of the dangerous sinner. Now this is going to stretch some of you. But verse 23 says, But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating. You remember I told you we're going to talk about making and pulling and hating. Hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. The instruction here is not as much to reach out as to watch out. You see, some of these that are lost, they've not, on, they've not only already determined that they don't want to hear the gospel, they're not going to believe the gospel. If you're not careful, they're going to do everything they can to pull you away from Christ. The word garment here, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh, I'm not trying to be gross, but I do want to be accurate, is literally referring to the undergarment, to your underwear. And so you want three guesses as to what he's referencing when he says hating the undergarment that's been defiled? <laughs> this is filthy, nasty, dirty, stinking underwear. And he says there are some that when you deal with them on behalf of Christ and his gospel, you need to be as careful as you would be packing your luggage when you've got clothes that are filthy in this way. That's not a pretty picture, Pastor. Well, sin never is. Sin is never a pretty picture. Jesus actually compared sin-sick hearts to open graves. Isaiah compared the sinful heart to a filthy rag. I, I, I told you one day earlier this week that that word was used to describe bandages that wrapped a wound. And that is the nicest of the ways that that word was used. The point that Jude is making is you need to watch out that when you're trying to share the gospel and be a witness that you don't compromise your own life with the idea that I'm going to become like them so that I can reach them. Now this may answer a question some of you are not even asking, but I'm going to answer it anyway. The Apostle Paul one time famously said that I become all things to all men that by all means I may win some. And there are some who take that verse to teach that you should do anything, wear anything, drink anything, eat anything, watch anything, listen to anything so that lost people won't think that you're a religious fuddy-duddy. To which Vance Havner, a great preacher of old, once said, you don't have to dress like a clown to witness at the circus. If you've got friends who drink, you don't have to, you don't have to drink beer to witness to somebody who drinks. If you've got foul-mouthed friends, you don't have to stop, start dropping F-bombs all the time. 
so that they'll think, well, I don't want them to think that I'm some stuck up, think I'm better than them, so I'll, I'll use the Lord's name in vain, and I'll drop these F-bombs, and I'll say all of these ungodly words. You don't have to skip church all the time on Wednesday night to try to reach people who are not concerned about the things of God. This morning, in our devotional time in Luke, we, we read about Something that Father Abraham said. And it reminds me of something else that Father Abraham did. And I I think it's very instructive here because uh, Brother Jude talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. I think back in verse 7. Do you remember what happened right before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? If you don't, I'm going to tell you real quick. God came and visited Abraham and said... I'm tired of the wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities around these two, and I'm going to pour out judgment on them. And Abraham said, Lord, what if I could find 50 righteous people living in Sodom and Gomorrah? You wouldn't destroy those 50 righteous people just to destroy all of the wicked sinners. Surely you would not destroy everybody if I could find 50 Godly people living in those cities and God who already knew the answer. Students, anytime you sense the Holy Spirit asking you a question, God's not trying to get information. He already knows. And God's, God, God, would you spare the cities if I could find 50 righteous people? And God said, well, I, I'll do that. I'll spare the city if you could find 50 righteous people. Well, Abraham already knew about those cities. So he doesn't go try to find 50. He knows he ain't going to find 50. He immediately starts talking God down. Well, God, how about this? What about 40? God says, I'll spare the city for 40. How, how about 30? How about 20? He, gets all, he talks God all the way down to 10. What if I could find 10 righteous people? And God said, if you can find 10 godly people living in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, I will not pour out judgment. Students, do you remember the believer that was living in Sodom? We don't have any indication that he was a believer until we get over to this parallel book of 2 Peter. And we find out that he was a believer. He was saved. What was his name? Lot was living in Sodom. And the Bible teaches us that Lot had sons and Lot had daughters. And his sons were married, and his daughters were married. Watch the math with me real quickly. I know it's it's Thursday morning of summer camp, but I want you to watch the math with me. There was Lot. He had two sons. Those two sons were married. He had two daughters, and those two daughters were married. And Lot had a wife. Lot thought, I'm going to reach Sodom by going down and living with and living like the people in Sodom. Abraham, here's my point. Abraham came closer to sparing Sodom living outside of Sodom than Lot had living down in Sodom. Lot could have been the answer to Abraham's intercessory prayer Before God, if Lot had just reached his own family, the people closest to him. Tonight, there's going to be a presidential debate. And there's going to be talking the country for the next several months about what we need to do to to make America great again. To win America. All these sorts of things. And those conversations have their place. But let me tell you, the only hope for America is not going to fly in on Air Force One. It's going to come with a Christian like you taking the gospel, taking their Bible, and sharing with a lost person how they can be saved. And you need to be careful That you don't believe the lie that you need to become like the world in order to try to win the world. On some, you need to have compassion making a difference. On others, boy, you need to snatch them like a hot branding iron out of the fire. And while you do it, hate the garment polluted by the flesh. Some of you remember when our student camp used to be over at Epworth 
by the sea, and many of you have been there. It's, it's named after the home place of John and Charles Wesley. Uh, Epworth by the sea, sit real still. Remember this tonight when Pastor Charles is heading into his conclusion. Makes a lot of noise with 130 people closing their Bibles and putting stuff up. Okay? So it's not a rebuke, just a, just a reminder. Okay? Epworth by the sea is named for the hometown of the Wesleys. John and Charles Wesley who were the founders of the Methodist movement. Epworth, England is where John and Charles Wesley were raised. Well, one night their home caught on fire. And in that old farmhouse, everybody got out. Mom and dad got out, and six of their seven children got out. The only one at that point in the fire that was still inside the house was John. There was no way that they could get back in the front of the house when somebody noticed John was sticking his head, sticking his face out of one of the upstairs windows. And history says that the people around that town literally climbed on top of one another. It wasn't some big tall house like maybe you're thinking of a two-story house today, but it wasn't, it wasn't really accessible to the ground easily either. And the people climbed on top of one another and built a human pyramid. You've seen how we stack these cups sometimes in the minute-to-win-it games? They started doing that. And build a human pyramid, a human ladder, really. And then John Wesley was able to crawl out of that window and make his way to safety. Now, the Methodist church has a lot of challenges today, but there was a time that the Methodist movement was responsible for one of the greatest spiritual awakenings in this country and ultimately around the world. Years later, John Wesley, a great, great preacher of the gospel, would write, That night... I was plucked as an iron from a burning fire thanks to a living ladder. You and I are a living ladder to a lost world. And I close with this simple thought, this question. Listen to it carefully. This morning in our devotional time, I ask you to write down the names of some people that you are praying for their salvation. You don't have to answer out loud. I don't need you to answer out loud. But did you have any names that you'd write down? If so, what's a great time as we close this morning to say, Lord, would you give me boldness and compassion when I get back home to share the gospel? And if you don't have any names there, God, would you give me love, boldness, concern to begin caring for those who are lost, because I want to be a difference maker.